Early start this morning, heading off to the Watersham Airfield in Suffolk, home of the British Army's fleet of Apache attack helicopters. Uh, I've been invited up there by the uh, flight safety section uh, for a drone awareness day. It's going to be a chance to speak to some of the military pilots. Also have a collection of other uh, professionals from the uh, various parts of the drone and unmanned aviation industry. Uh, beautiful day and a chance to get up close and personal with some of uh, the British Army's uh, biggest and nastiest helicopters. So uh, should be a good day. a lot of today is probably going to be focused on the perspective from the Apache helicopters uh, view if you like there uh, obviously the pilots are going to be flying very large noisy machines very fast uh, with limited warning or visibility of uh, very small uh, aircraft like drones new AVs I guess really one of the big issues you've got is that um, whereas most uh, aircraft are not allowed to fly below 500 feet altitude and we obviously uh, rarely fly can rarely fly anywhere in the world above 400 feet certainly in the UK 400 feet is the maximum flight we can fly a drone so you're supposed to have that 100 foot buffer uh, Apache helicopters though they can fly right down to ground level and often do and that's where the situation can um, suddenly take a turn for the worse anyway it should be a very interesting day so let's see what they've got to say Monsters. Well, what a day. Um, I know great weather always helps, of course, but it is not every day. You get to talk to military pilots and get a pilot's eye view from within the cockpit. Um, for me, biggest take from today was dispelling the myth that I firmly believed in that you'll always hear helicopters before you see them. That low level approach uh, on the Apache flight showed how he was still making practically no move. real noise when he was less than 500 Just. meters away from, um, from us when he was flying at a very low level. Just beginning to hear a background thud now. Yeah. The actual sound is coming from the right now, reflecting off those buildings over there. Conversely, when he was flying, when the Apache was flying much higher, uh, it was much further away, but far, far easier to hear. So. I have to say, looking back over the rest of the day, well, look, I have to say, it was a really useful chance to hear the issues faced by all types of users of low-level airspace, as well as the Army Apache pilots. There were people from Suffolk Fire and Rescue, uh, Lowland Search and Rescue, uh, and from a number of different counties, uh, Network Rail, who outlined the fairly impressive operations that they have for surveying countless miles of railway throughout the UK. Uh, industrial uh, surveying companies like uh, Texo 
uh, as well as commercial drone operators and, and trainers. Uh, Dan722 based in Ipswich and of course uh, UAV8 uh, also based in Ipswich who I did my own permission for commercial operations training with a few years ago. What I found quite interesting is how professional and well prepared all of these commercial drone operators are, especially when it comes to planning and uploading flight details and checking for restricted airspace, uploading NOTAMs where necessary, and also contacting the control uh, towers of, of smaller airfields if they're flying uh, anywhere in the area. There was a lot of discussion on how best to upload and share flight plans, including the possibility of hobbyist flights uh, being uploaded as well. But of course, what came out is how, um, well, one way this information is. Military training is usually conducted without warning or any advance information on where and when they're going to be flying. I don't know, you try Googling uh, for a map on Apache training areas in the UK and you don't actually get that very far. Uh, look up on Nats Altitude Angel and you certainly don't see the huge training area that spans Suffolk and Essex noted anywhere. Same if you go to uh, the immensely useful drone scene uh, site from the Grey Arrows Forum. Again, you see the airfield restricted zone, but no mention of the training area. So to me, here, it, this is the crux of the problem. We have very clear and tight regulations set down by the CAA for unmanned aerial vehicles, which basically push most flights for us out to rural areas and to keep under the 400 foot limit, which is the premise that manned air aviation sticks to above 500 feet and we have that nice 100 foot buffer and all is hunky dory. But as I pointed out to the army pilots, even with the best will in the world, the best integration of the various flight warnings and notification systems used, by far and away the majority of flights that are at risk of being intercepted are perfectly valid hobbyist flights that have no requirement to upload or warn of their planned flight and who will quite legitimately be flying in rural areas, most commonly between 50 and 300 feet. And whilst flying around well out of harm's way, out of nowhere at any time you could run into one of these monsters popping up over a tree line, quite literally flying below 50 feet. Because yes, believe it or not, underwire flying is something they actually train for and do indeed have a look. Uh, interesting bit of the Apache's uh, armory are a series of wire cutters positioned above and below the cockpit to cut any power lines they may hit when flying very low out on a mission. Impressive stuff but to do this you've got to be able to train at similar low altitudes and that's I suppose where things can go wrong especially as they can't do low level flying over residential areas so they're also pushed out to rural areas just like most hobbyist drone flights are. So what is the risk? What can we do? Well, look, sadly, the current fleet of Apaches we learned today don't even transmit ADS-B. So you won't even be seeing them pop up if you've got one of the newer DJI drones that has got ADS-B reading capability. Uh, the newer Apaches coming in later this year do. So that will be a good improvement. But for now, with none of the existing fleet transmitting their immediate location on ADS-B, then these really are, I think, the equivalent of a huge juggernaut truck speeding down a motorway going far faster than you with practically no way of seeing you or being seen until it's too late. But this is the reality of military training isn't it and ultimately these guys are doing their job for a far greater good than you or I will often even know or be able to work out. So to me look just a small boat always give way to big ships. Uh, we need to take steps to avoid being that drone pilot making the front page for crashing into a helicopter. Uh, I did say, what is the actual risk? And by that, not only did I mean what are the chances of actually hitting one, but also the chances of actually doing damage if you do. You often hear the argument that these machines are designed for fighting in the most hostile places on Earth. So it's a bit unrealistic to think that a little tiny DJI drone can bring them down. And of course, to be honest, that is mostly true. These machines are absolutely built for warfare with impressively toughened windscreens and a host of armory keeping the pilots and the machines safe. But that does not mean that hitting one couldn't cause significant damage to some of the lesser protected parts of the machine. Um, Air 2S, but imagine a DJI FPV flying at full pelt, 130 Ks, 90 miles an hour 
hitting the side of an Apache where the windows are nowhere near as resilient as the front windscreen. And yeah, okay, admittedly, I do find it unlikely that uh, those enormously strong rotors would even blink at uh, hitting a, a Mavic 2 Pro or anything. I would not want to take the bet. And I definitely wouldn't want to take the bet on the uh, far lighter, thinner tail rotors. Either way, the way I see it, whatever the likelihood of damage to the aircraft, a full frontal impact would still be such a huge distraction to the pilot that frankly cannot be good when you're flying a five ton machine at just 50 feet. As more and more of us start having fun with drones, then a near miss uh, gets a little bit more likely at some stage. If they're below 500 feet, shouldn't they be looking out for our drones then, I hear you say? Well, uh, a fair point. I wonder how many of you would avoid talking when flying a complicated manoeuvre with your drone. I know when I was back in Iceland the other month, I could not say a word when I was flying my Mavic 2 Pro over the volcano's crater. And I, all I had to do was just look at one single screen. Now take a look at what the Apache pilots are looking at. Uh, I'm sorry, this is more of an airliner cockpit. I couldn't even start to estimate how complicated and distracted all of these screens are. And remember, they have an eye patch uh, over one of their eyes too, a, a display, a digital display as well. And just to top it off, more than half of the forward view is obscured by dashboard and pillars. This literally is their view of the outside world, speeding along at over 100 miles an hour, flying something a thousand times more complex than your Air 2S and only seeing it with one good eye, which to me is mad. It says a lot about the type of person flying these machines, frankly well beyond what most of us can do, I think. So this is my point today. Irrespective of whether you think you're in the right, the bottom line is that if a helicopter is anywhere near you, then a fast descent is pretty much the only thing you can do. The moment you hear that thudding, things are already too close for comfort and you need to get down fast. Uh, I was working out some of the specs. Most DJI models can only descend at around six meters or 20 feet per second. So if you're flying up 300 feet high, that is a full 15 seconds before you are down and out of harm's way. Now, one of these machines is flying at 100 knots. That's over 100 miles an hour, 50 meters every second. That is 500 meters in 10 seconds. We've already seen they can be less than 500 meters away and still you not be hearing them. So in short, even if you are flying your drone right overhead, they can hit it before you can get a chance to land. So I, I was quite surprised when I worked all of that out and it kind of does bring it right home. Don't really want to paint too much of a picture of doom and gloom here though. Look, in reality, I think normally you are going to hear them well before they're in close proximity. You'll usually have time to descend. Sadly though, without them publishing flights or training areas on the usual apps that most drone users use, there is no real warning to most drone flyers that they're even in an area where training flights might occur. Uh, I genuinely hope that some of the discussions we had today will help change that. But either way, knowing how slow the armed forces change their procedures, I wouldn't hold your breath, frankly. One thing you can do though, right from now, is call the air traffic control tab directly if you plan to fly your drone anywhere remotely near them. Uh, this is something they genuinely encourage as they will usually tell you if there are any flights planned. It is something though that I've advocated in the past and I have had some subscribers get in touch telling me that the response from some tower controllers hasn't always been that constructive or polite. And this is a point I made very clear today uh, as well. I said the control towers really should only ever be polite and helpful to hobbyists calling up to double check if it's okay to fly. And this, I hope, is very much a message they are going to uh, take to all of the controllers around the country. But to be honest, in most cases, as I said, you're going to get a good response if you do call a tower to double check. And I really do think it's a very good thing to do. Anyway, Ted's getting bored, you heard the bark there. Very different video today. Uh, sometimes it's useful just to get to see how things look, I think, from an alternative perspective. And if I took away two things today, I think it would be that these are mighty, impressive, fast, but very stealthy aircraft. There really isn't that much chance of the pilot seeing me first, so I had better get out of their way first. But it really was a great, great fun day to look at these machines and getting you know, our own private flying display was, was, was pretty impressive too. Um, 
I have to set my hat off to the team at Wattishingham Airfield as well for reaching out like this. It's always better, I think, to talk and despite the major limitations they're operating under, there is a genuine desire to understand and work with drone users and to hear our side of the story. So to me, that has to be a very good thing. Anyway, look, glorious evening. Uh, time for me to get out the little Air 2S now. I have to admit, I had to keep it kept it in the car today. There's a little bit of size envy going on in that room earlier on and I, I didn't get to uh, show off uh, any of the drones that I fly. But look, it was, it was immense fun and a, a really good day. As ever, give me a little thumbs up if you did like this video. Thumbs down isn't going to change the army flying policy but it will still affect my video. So if you really feel that strongly, press that thumbs down twice. But look, either way, till next time, have fun, happy flying.